often get the question uh, of how to achieve diabetic remission and, and, and that's the whole reason why we started the diabetic remission clinic here at the Royal Veterinary College. Um, and the first thing that we did as part of that initiative is we looked at all the literature to figure out what's the evidence as it stands now. And of course we were also aware of those um, rumors that glargine was the super miracle insulin that would put uh, high numbers of diabetic cats into remission. And that is the reason why we wanted to first look at the literature. And as a result we produced a systematic review uh, which we published in the Veterinary Journal, uh, which you can all uh, look up uh, on, online as well, in which we were really objective with the current data as it stands and by really looking at um, the evidence base, looking at the follow-up, the methodology of those studies, any bias that uh, was included in those studies, we unfortunately had to establish that the evidence base for factors inducing remission is very slim. Um, so in terms of insulin type, it is true that the highest remission rates have been recorded with glargine insulin thus far, uh, but those particular studies were very vulnerable to be uh, biased by confounding factors, as we call it with a fancy word. Uh, basically what they did, mainly they used Australian Burmese cats, which um, are cats with a different type of diabetes. Um, they also excluded a lot of cats that couldn't comply with the particular treatment protocol and that therefore uh, artificially inflated the remission rates. And most importantly, they didn't uh, compare the insulin uh, to another insulin in an equal fashion. So it wasn't a randomized blinded clinical trial as we like to see them in order to guard ourselves uh, in making the wrong conclusions after the study. So after that systematic review we were a little bit depressed because we thought the, the, the state of the nation was better than it was but it therefore um, meant also that we wanted to, to, to do better and to learn from the lessons in the past and as part of the diabetic remission clinic initiatives we went to a second phase where we started our own clinical trials and after having criticized everyone else in the field the pressure therefore was on for us to produce clinical trials that were indeed better that could lead to more sound conclusions and I'm pleased to say that we have now concluded a very first clinical trial comparing two insulin types in diabetic cats um, and those are the glargine which was proposed to be uh, the best insulin that we all should be using but indeed the problem was that is not a licensed insulin so it put us in a, in a bit of pressure as veterinary surgeons to, to deny our clients this potentially very useful insulin uh, but that's why we wanted that one in our new clinical trial so we compared glargine with PZI and that was in the shape of prosinc which is produced by Boehringer. Um, so we uh, produced the largest clinical trial ever in veterinary medicine uh, comparing 24 cats on glargine with 22 on uh, protamine zinc, PZI the pro zinc, and we did that in a randomized fashion. So beforehand we didn't know which cat was going to receive which insulin and we made sure as best as we could to make sure that the other parameters were all the same. So they were on the same food, they were on the same treatment regimen, the same monitoring protocol. Um, and that has led to results that are quite remarkable. Um, and basically what we can say on the basis of this cleanest study ever, that glargine and PZI prosinc produce similar glycemic control and similar remission rates. And therefore this has busted the myth that glargine is this wonderful uh, insulin type that is better than others uh, or at least better than PZI insulin. Now the beauty of all of this is that we know that PZI insulin is licensed 
for us to use as veterinary surgeons uh, in the UK, in Europe and elsewhere as well. Um, so that's a great advantage because it comes with the backing of a pharmaceutical company that, uh, that actually supports the veterinary clinicians in using the drug. And if there's a bad batch of the drug, of, of the insulin, then we will know about it. Whereas if you are using Glargine, because the human insulin industry has no interest in cats being treated with this insulin type, if there's a bad reaction to the insulin, then that's that doesn't have a reporting mechanism that we could take advantage of and that would make uh, use of uh, glargin safer. The other thing we've seen as well with glargin is that it's, it has fallen out of patent which means that in the US, for instance, glargine has become very, very expensive and some owners have had real trouble still paying for the glargine treatment uh, of their cats. So, so all kinds of issues that arise, therefore, when using a non-veterinary licensed insulin. I still use glargine, uh, but I start off with PZI uh, because that has now been shown to be a really good cat, diabetic cat insulin. But if an individual cat doesn't respond to it, then indeed I'm allowed to go off cascade and look for another insulin type that might do the trick. And that could therefore be uh, can insulin. Uh, but, you know, glargine is still an alternative that is attractive because it's got a long duration of action action just like PZI prosing um, and on average can insulin has a shorter duration of action in the cat so that will be uh, the reason why I would pick glargine after prosing but definitely would try PZI first for the reasons explained. Now the other thing to mention in this whole remission story is that um, people might have seen on the web um, others talking about 80% remission rates or 100% remission rates with beautiful intense protocols. That systematic review I spoke to you about um, was, was really an eye-opener with regards to those remission rates as well. And after having conducted uh, these trials as part of the diabetic remission clinic, I think it's fair to say that if you take an average diabetic cat population, you probably can count on one in three diabetic cats going into remission with good treatment uh, protocols or tre treatment management and that aims for good glycemic control and it doesn't have to be overly tight glycemic control at the moment there is not enough evidence to say that we have to go close to the hypoglycemic range factually there's no evidence to say that that gives you better results maybe in the future there will be another story to tell but at this moment in time there's no argument for that which is great in a way because it also means that we don't need to go close to the hypoglycemic range where uh, hypoglycemia actually can happen as well. So one in three in the general population, maybe if you take a clean diabetic cat population without pancreatitis, without acromegaly, because that's another disease we need to talk about, um, then you, you might bump it up to 40 or 50 percent. Uh, but definitely you should not expect anything higher than that on average. A lot of people ask me, what is your monitoring protocol? Um, and I uh, often say, well, I don't do protocols, although I sometimes make a mistake and mention the word myself as well. I might have done it in this uh, video as well. Uh, we like protocols because it gives us certainty, but the problem with protocols is twofold. Um, one is that we rely on numbers that are sometimes lying to us, and especially in the cat with stress hyperglycemia, that glucose value you have just determined could well be wrong and the other thing as well that protocols do it it sort of forces a particular patient to be treated or monitored in a very specific way which sort of neglects the fact that every cat is different and every owner is different um, I've got a busy life so it would be very difficult for me to do a strict monitoring protocol um, and still have a diabetic cat and by forcing particular protocols upon P 
people, I, I, I guess you make them feel guilty at the very least if they can't do it or they force themselves to do it and you make their lives miserable potentially. So what I like more is to stick to principles. Um, and I get to know my diabetic cat owner as well as the diabetic cat and figure out what is best for that particular cat owner combination. Um, and if it is a cat owner combination where hypoglycemia is a big worry, then for instance, I do more monitoring. So I talk to them about home blood glucose monitoring, for instance, or I might have them check for glucose in the urine. And once the glucose in the urine disappears, then uh, I tell them to come to the practice because that is a sign of overdosing. Um, so with particular owners that are either very passionate about getting the best possible clinical results or they are very worried about hypoglycemia, I will do uh, monitoring more frequently. Whereas with other owners that might be on a budget or um, we've got a cat that is unhandleable um, or you know they don't have the lifestyle that suits frequent interventions, then we relax um, and that's perfectly possible as well and you, you often get amazingly good results with that approach as well. The only thing you have to say about that is that if we don't monitor as often there can be more statistically speaking uh, more of a chance of hypoglycemia occurring and us not uh, detecting it. Um, so it's very much figuring out which cat have I got in front of us, uh, which owner do I have in front of me um, and, and let's, let's make up a plan together. We've got different ways of monitoring, we've got glucose curves, we've got fructosamines, we've got urine glucose, um, all of those tools we can use, all of them have advantages and disadvantages um, and, and certainly um, we should educate owners about that as well and uh, if I may plug something, we've got a Facebook site in which uh, we have uh, unbiased information for diabetic uh, pet owners that talk about those advantages and disadvantages and that's a Facebook site uh, for the RVC Diabetic Remission Clinic. So I think a conversation needs to take place to figure out how are we going to do this together in the best possible way but also being aware of the impact on the lifestyle of the owner uh, because it's easy to have success in diabetes in uh, in the next six months what we want is success in the next six years um, and therefore we need to pay attention to the impact on the lifestyle in designing that monitoring protocol. Um, so that's a good question. Why um, do some cats um, become non-diabetic again? Um, and basically that comes down to why um, does diabetes arise in the cat in the first place? Um, and we do believe it's a combination of things. So it's a combination of the beta cells not functioning well and the body not responding well to the insulin. So beta cell dysfunction and insulin resistance. Um, and that will have genetic as well as environmental uh, reasons behind it. So if we therefore, unlike as is uh, the case in the dog, still have some beta cells that are alive um, and recoverable, um, then remission can occur. And we know that, for instance, diabetes itself can harm the beta cells. So if you've got a diabetic state, glucose is high, Gluco, glucose or glycogen deposits occur as a result of the diabetes in the beta cells and that will harm the beta cells and we end up with less beta cells as a consequence of diabetes. If we now go and start treating the diabetic cat, we lower the glucose, which means we get less of that phenomenon, which we often call uh, glucotoxicity. We recover some of the beta cell function and then we suddenly see a cat doing much better quite soon after starting insulin. That's because basically we've given the beta cells a spa break. Uh, they've recovered because we were giving the insulin for the cat. The beta cells didn't have to do that job themselves and uh, they've just been burned out. We've given them a spa break and now they can function again. 
Now, it doesn't mean that they're completely healthy. They are still abnormal. And that's the reason why some fat cats never become diabetic, whereas others um, are not even fat and they become diabetic. So there is something wrong with the diabetic cat intrinsically, genetically. Um, so if we get them into remission, it doesn't mean we've cured them. It means that temporarily they don't need insulin, but diabetes is always around the corner. Um, and therefore, one of the questions that, that probably is going to be asked as well is what do you do with a cat in remission? Well, we still treat them as a diabetic. They might not need the insulin injections, but we still want to give that low carbohydrate diet. We still want to make sure that we, uh, if at all possible, don't inject the steroids or the progestogens. Uh, we make sure that they don't um, put on weight. Because um, one of the other factors that actually came out of our, what I think is a beautiful clinical trial, uh, the, the best so far, is that insulin type might not be a big deal in terms of achieving remission because the glycine and the PZI prosine produce the same results. But what was significantly different in those cats that went into remission compared to those that didn't go into remission was weight loss. So those cats that achieved a at least 2% weight loss within the first month after starting treatment, those were the ones that had an increased chance of ending up with remission. So probably as a veterinary profession, we have been focusing too much on insulin types and monitoring methods and not enough on getting rid of the predisposing factors and especially uh, being overweight. So remission, um, like I said before, different figures are bantered about. Um, very high ones can be found on the web, but if we are very matter of fact about it and we look at the evidence that we can trust the most, then one in three would be uh, the best guesstimate at this moment in time. The remission rates will be much higher if we can identify and eliminate the risk factors for diabetes mellitus. And that takes me to uh, the next point. Those risk factors include obesity or being overweight, using of steroids. So if we can do something about those factors in an individual cat, our remission rates jump up amazingly. And the final factor to really bear in mind um, across the world, but uh, above all in the United Kingdom, is acromegaly, which is this overproduction of growth hormone by the pituitary. Uh, this can happen for years without there being any typical signs of acromegaly occurring. And the very first sign that occurs is the onset of diabetes mellitus. And some groundbreaking research here at the Royal Veterinary College has established that one in four of the diabetic cats in the UK in fact have their diabetes because of acromegaly. So they in fact have a pituitary tumor in their brain causing the diabetes mellitus. And that means that if we do something about the acromegaly, which we can do through a surgery called hypophysectomy or through a drug that is called passireotide, we actually can get amazingly high remission rates because we take away the reason to be diabetic. Um, and then we see remission rates as high as 85%, which is marvelous because in those case scenarios, we are effectively curing um, diabetes, uh, which is something that I always wanted to do when starting this project. And in this particular type of diabetes, we are doing that, uh, which gives us great joy.